It is so good to see everyone and to hear that everyone is on Zoom and online and maybe even later on you're watching it on demand. We're so glad to be here with you. We miss you. I miss you, the Harborside team. We miss you, but we're so glad that we're in your living room, that we're in your lounge, or maybe we're in your car. Hopefully they're the only places we're in, amen, but we're so glad to be here today. You know, my wife and I, and I know the team have here, have been praying for you this lockdown and, and continue to pray for you that just that this season would be kind to you. And so why don't we begin like that? Let me pray for you, and then we'll jump into the Word of God. Father, I just thank you for the precious people that are listening today. Father, even now live or on demand, I just thank you for their lives. I pray, Father, in this season you be with them. I pray that wherever they are, there would be a sense of peace that comes upon their household. And Father, we trust you for miracles. We trust you for breakthrough. And we thank you that you are always present in the midst of our problems. In Jesus' name. And everyone shouted at home, online, or in the chat. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the presence of God in the problems of life. Here we are in our third lockdown, and seemingly our most serious lockdown, and you know, our hair's all growing from no barbers, and our toilet roll is, is stacking up, but the reality is this is a tough season for many people. I remember at the beginning of the COVID season, sitting next to a friend while they buried their father over Zoom. And this is a tough season, and I get it, and there are people even listening to me now. You're in a tough season. Business has been impacted. Family and health has been impacted. Work life or maybe different things around you have been impacted and you're in a tough season and you're facing problems. Maybe there's people even listening now and it's not really COVID that's the problem, it's just life. Relationships are breaking down, there's tensions at home, maybe there's vision has gone or maybe you're sick, maybe you're separated, maybe you're just feeling fearful. Well, I'm here to encourage you this morning. I'm here to remind you and encourage you that even though we have the bad news of COVID, the truth is that does not and never will nullify the good news of Jesus Christ. That no matter what season you're in, no matter what season I'm in, that Jesus Christ, and here's the good news, is still powerful. He is still sovereign. He is still in control. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the one who restores, rebuilds, and rescues. He is still our ever-present help in a time of need. This morning, you have the presence of God in the problems of life. And that double dimension, that idea of God's presence being existent in our problems, is what God was teaching Isaiah. There's some words at the beginning of the verses that were so beautifully read that are the key to understanding this vision. And scholars even say it's the key to understanding the the elements of the vision. Here's what the Bible says, Isaiah 6, verse 1 to verse 4. I'll just read the, the first part. In the year that King Uzziah died. I want you to underline that or type it in the chat or, or, or lock in your mind. I want you to think there right there is the problem. In the year that King Uzziah died, that's a problem. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's presence. In this text, you've got problems and presence. But the key is this, in the year that King Uzziah died. Like many of you, Isaiah is in a tough season. He is prophesying and he's preaching uh, through uh, national rebellion, and Israel is in a national crisis, but it's not viral. It's spiritual, it's moral, it's social. And in Isaiah's world, there are problems everywhere. But it's similar to today. There's national rebellion. There's corrupt leaders. Israel has rejected God. And in this chapter, God has commissioned Isaiah to go and proclaim that the Assyrians and the Babylonians will now carry Israel captive, hence the Babylonian exile. And to top it all off, and this is the root of what I'm trying to say, to top it all off, King Uzziah has just died. That is a massive problem. King Uzziah was Israel's longest serving and most successful ruler. He's actually Isaiah's cousin, but he was a great military ruler. He brought peace to the area. He brought peace to the enemies of Judah. 
In fact, it says in 2 Chronicles 26 that he, he created weapons of warfare and he invented what we call the catapult. This guy was a success. He was prolific in all the nations. In fact, he was so prolific as a, as a, as a defender of Judah that other nations like Assyria wouldn't even go near Israel at this time. He was strong, he was famous, and he was prosperous. Follow me, church. He controlled the, the trade route between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea. This, this guy brought long-term national wealth and prosperity. He expanded the kingdom. He rebuilt Jerusalem. And above all, he loved God in the early phase of his life and did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he ruled like that for 52 years. You've got to understand the context of this text. In the year that King Uzziah died, you see, Uzziah represented a secure and prosperous national future. He represented hope. He represented peace. He represented success. He represented all that was good about life for 52 years, and now he is dead. The reason this vision is so profound is because of its timing. It comes at a time of national crisis. Uzziah is dead. You know, they, scholars say that when Isaiah died, war clouds gathered in the north. And one commentator said these words. He said, Isaiah would have been disillusioned and discouraged. Put yourself in this situation. Questions in the mind. Who will now defend Judah? Who will stabilize the economy? Who will expand our kingdom? Who will secure our future? In the year that King Uzziah died, he has a vision. Right at the perfect time, God gives Isaiah this vision that we read about today and it shifts his perspective. It touches his heart. It opens his eyes and helps him remember who the real king is. He sees a Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He was seated, he was bigger, and he was active and God allowed Isaiah to see this in the midst of a national crisis. God wanted Isaiah to remember who the real king was. God is showing Isaiah two main things in the midst of his crisis. And I think the two things that we need to know, that we need to be reminded of in the midst of any problems or any crisis we face. Here's the first thing he reminded Isaiah of. Number one, I I'm still in control. Someone shout amen at home. Type it in the chat, amen. God spoke to, God showed Isaiah this vision. And in a way he was saying, I'm still in control. You see, when you look at the text, you see the Lord sitting on the throne. But this contrast between a king that's died and a Lord on the throne. A king that's died, a successful, and a Lord that's on the throne. That is there because it is purposeful. God was saying, Isaiah, yes, I recognize the earthly king is dead, but the heavenly king still reigns. Yes, he's in the grave. It looks like the future has died and the hope has gone, but I am still seated. He may be buried, but I'm sat on the throne. He was communicating to Isaiah, I know you're worried about war. I know you're worried about economy. I know you're worried about the future. But the hope of Israel does not lie in the power of that throne, Isaiah. It relies on the power of this throne. I am still in control. You see, some of you need to hear that this morning. He is in control of your life. Some of you need to hear that because you've been pondering Maybe some of the questions that Isaiah or Israel may have been pondering. What will my future look like? What will happen to me ahead? What lies ahead? You're worried maybe about the kids. You're worried about finance. Maybe you're worried about work. You're worried about your health. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to remind you that your future is not controlled. Here's the good news. By you or I. Your future is not controlled by them. Your future is not controlled by this season. It is not controlled by us getting that specific outcome. God is in control of your life. COVID may be present in our world, 
But remember, God is still ruling it. He speaks to Isaiah in the midst of all of this national calamity and shows him that I'm still on the throne. I'm in control. The psalmist puts it like this. Psalms 103 verse 9. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there, he rules over everything. And we need to be reminded of that in the midst of a crisis, that there are people that we're relying on and and medics and politicians, and I get it. They all have a fantastic role to play in the health of our nation, but God is in control. And when your Uzziah dies, when your hope fades, or the future looks uncertain, remember that earth does not always reflect heaven. There is still a king on the throne, and there is still a God who is bigger than every crisis, and he is still in control. I know life throws up pain, and it throws up problems, but my Bible says that all things have will and do work together for good to those that love God and accord according to his purpose. It's going to work together for good. God is in control somehow. Job puts it like this, the book of Job 23, 14. He says these words. I love these words. He will do whatever he has planned for he controls, he controls my destiny. Turn around, say that to your kids, say that to your husband, say that to your dog, say that to the plants, whatever people think is strange. He controls my destiny. In a crisis, we can forget that. In a crisis, we can think everything else controls it. We can wonder why things occur. I don't know why all things occur, but I do know one thing. He controls our destiny. Let me have some fun. Do you know he controls your destiny? I'm going to gross you out a little bit now. Okay. The day that you were fertilized, it's like, what? This preacher's talking about fertilization so early on a Sunday morning. The day that you were fertilized, one egg was released, an exact, that specific one egg, 250 million sperm, hopefully, traveled to that egg and went out like a heat-seeking missile. And 249,999,999 died along the way. And that one specific sperm, that one specific egg, fertilized to create you. The specific DNA, the specific genes, born in a specific generation, born to those specific parents, born with those specific traits to fulfill a purpose that God had for you. Listen, I'm trying to tell you today, before you were formed, God knew you. He has, was in control of your destiny and he still is. Life isn't chance. I know that maybe you came into the world a a crazy way or maybe you thought that you were a mistake. Listen, never let how you came into the world affect why you came into the world. God was in control. Your life is not a mistake. He was in control then and he's still in control of your life now. Throughout your life, God has weaved DNA and experiences and choices and life lessons and mistakes Yes, mistakes and relationships and jobs and the prayers you've prayed. He's weaved them all together into this thing we call destiny. He was in control. He created you. He's guided you. He shaped you. He opened doors and he closed others. He brought people to you and he took some people away. He released opportunities. He's taken you through tough seasons. Sometimes he called you to stay. Sometimes he called you to go. Sometimes he called you to wait. And a lot of the time, we probably didn't even realize it was him. But I'm here to remind you that God has been in control of your life and he still is. Type it in the chat. Tell someone there, he is still in control. You know, I say amen when I think about my own life. You know, the day I got saved, I bowed my knee in a little church in Manchester. And as I bowed my knee to pray a prayer that they call the sinner's prayer and just to receive Jesus, the drummer who was stood on, ran to meet me and met me on the floor and he left his drums, threw his, came down and prayed with me. 
And I was like, I thought this is a little bit crazy. You know, I come straight out of the world, amen. And he leads me to Jesus Christ. And what I hadn't realized was for six months, even though he didn't know me, even though he didn't know where I lived, he had been praying for me to receive Jesus. My sisters were going to church in Newcastle. They'd text someone who text someone who text someone. That there was this guy in Manchester off his head on drugs and involved in crime, and he needed Jesus. And there was a drummer in the middle of Moss Side, Manchester, praying for a guy he didn't know. And lo and behold, I walk into Wednesday service, bow my knee and give my life to Jesus Christ. And I'm prayed for by the person who's been praying for me. It was God. Someone say it was God. And I didn't even realize it. That's the reality of life. So often there are things that are occurring in our life and God has been in control and he's in control of your life. And that was the greatest day of my life. My sins were forgiven. Chains of addiction were broken. Nothing was too big for God. And that is the second thing that God begins to teach Isaiah. He's taught Isaiah, yes, the king is dead, but the Lord is on the throne. I'm in control, Isaiah. Your future isn't in his eye. Your future's in me. He's taught him that. But the vision also has another element. And this is what he teaches Isaiah, and he's teaching us today, and that is this. I am bigger than your crisis. He sees the vision. The Lord is sitting on the throne, and it says these words. He is high. He is lifted up. And the train of his robe, the hem, the lower part of his robe, filled the temple. This is about size, proximity, perspective. Ancient times, thrones were usually at the top of six steps. First, Corinthians, First Kings 10 talks about Solomon's throne being at the top of six steps. But here, in Isaiah's vision, the king of kings is on a throne that is elevated even higher than any earthly king. Jewish garments had hems at the bottom. Often they would have tassels, uh, 613 tassels, it would remind me of the 613 laws. And, and the Bible says that this hem of the, of the royal robe of God wasn't just a normal robe like maybe Uzziah wore. The train, the lower part, the bit that followed after God filled the temple. Come on, imagine the vision that Isaiah is seeing. Your cousins just died. 52 years of security under this king and suddenly... There's a king on the throne, and he is bigger than everything that is going on in the world. I feel that in my spirit, even as I said that right now. He sees that God is bigger than everything that is going on in the world. I pray that you would see that as I preach today. God is giving Isaiah perspective. Isn't that what we need so often when we're facing crisis? So often what we have to do is we have to shift our perspective. And God shifts Isaiah's perspective. And you know what he sees? He sees how small he is and how big God is. That's what I love about praise. As these awesome worship team praise and Pastor Dave led us in worship, the Spirit of God, we lifted our eyes off the problems. We lifted our eyes off of off vaccines and off politics and off, and off what is going on in the church. And we looked to a God who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. He's bigger than your crisis. God was communicating something to Isaiah right at this perfect time. And he was saying, Isaiah, I don't operate on or from a human level. I'm not King Uzziah. I don't function like that. I'm the Lord sitting on the throne and I fill the temple. I'm not man. I don't function like angels. I am God. He said, Isaiah, your situation may be big, but it is not bigger than me. And I want to declare that over your life this morning, on Zoom, online, or on demand, your problem and situation may be big, but it is not bigger than God. And if we pray and praise and cry out to Him, He will answer and He will move for you. How many times do we sit feeling overwhelmed, overpowered, and overcome? Our desires die. Dreams and solutions and prospects. But I'm here to encourage you that your God is bigger. Your God is greater. Your God is stronger than anything you will ever face. And he loves you. His power is absolute. His understanding is incomprehensible. 
and his ability is beyond definition. You know what happens right when God shows up. Seas split. Mountains move. Finances come. Nations repent. Churches thrive. Ministries flourish. The sick get healed and the dead find life. That is the God that we serve. A God who is bigger than everything we face in life. I don't know what problems you're facing. Cash flow problems, business problems, relationship problems. He's bigger and he wants to move for you. If you pray, if you praise, if you'll come to the throne of grace and acknowledge the one who's in control and and say, God, move for me. Miracles can happen. There's nothing too big or too small for God. And I close. In 2014, and there's a picture behind me, a, a lady named Yvonne came to our church. And I, the privilege of being in ministry, and particularly the way our church is positioned, it was very much an outreach, you know, an outreach center. And uh, the privilege of being in that position is just the, the miracle testimonies that uh, would flood throughout the church of people just finding God. And I think one of the most prolific lessons for me about how big God is was, was this story that we were personally involved in, which is Yvonne. Here she is, 2014. She's been a heroin and crack addict for years. Started on Valium when she was 16, started on heroin when she was 19. She'd been in rehab four times. The situation was utterly hopeless. Family had given up. Drug services didn't work. She had two children, but they were both born with what they call neonatal abstinence syndrome. Or on the street, we call it crack babies. The babies were born addicted to heroin and crack cocaine. The youngest, Liam, who would sit in our front row for, for three or four years, was severely disabled. He was born blind and he was born with 50% of his brain. It's a, it was a bad situation. It was a painful situation. And a few weeks before I spoke to her on the phone, she called me. She'd had a dream. She wasn't from a Christian background. She'd never been in church. She'd only been for funerals and weddings. And she had a dream and she was behind a closed door. And she could hear petrifying noises and screams. And she, in her own voice, was screaming out for this man called Jesus. And I'm going to read her words and I'm going to quote her. As I began shouting for Jesus to help me from the horrific noises, uh, they, they seemed to stop and I heard a loud voice say, Yvonne, this is your last chance. I walked down a corridor with doors either side. Noises were coming back, but the doors were locked. But they were trying to get to me and the one named Jesus was had chains and the doors were closed. He was standing at the end of the corridor with his arms open. His face was just like pure pure light. He was holding the ends of chains and he said to me, Yvonne, don't look. Keep your eyes on me and you'll be okay. She has this dream. No Christian background. No one's witness to her. Lives 20 miles from church. She has this dream and wakes up from it and realizes that the next time she takes heroin, she's going to die. And what happened was a miracle. She searched online on Google and she typed in the words, how to apologize to God. And she said sorry to God the best, she know, best way she know how. And she embarked on a 10-week home detox. With the power of Jesus running through her veins, I'm happy to say to God's glory, a 19-year addiction was broken. She said what rehab couldn't do, what family couldn't do, Jesus did. And the reason I met her is because 20 miles away from the church, she received a flyer for our church that we have never outreached there. It's too far for our church. But she received the flyer, called me. She came to church. I remember her lifting her frail hand. She accepted Jesus Christ, was baptized in water, was filled with the Spirit, and her life went on. Here's a slide. She is now saved, set free, healthy, happy, and transformed. And I remember seeing this situation, probably the biggest scenario that I've seen in my life, in in life, in ministry life. And you realize something, your situation may be big, but it is never bigger than God. God has a way of reaching people, of building his church, of doing something, taking, making good come out of bad, letting life come out of loss. I don't know all the ins and outs of how God works, but I do know this. He is bigger than your crisis. Yvonne had a dream. Isaiah had a vision. But the lesson was the same, right? 
He's in control. He's bigger than your crisis. And today, you have access to the presence of God, even in the midst of the problems of life. And I want you to leave being encouraged that you can access that presence. It hasn't gone anywhere. I know Uzziah has died, but you can pray. You can praise. And I pray that you would begin to catch a vision that your God is still on the throne and he's bigger than your crisis. He loves you and he's for you. Amen? You believe it? Type in the chat, I believe. Tell your neighbor, I believe. Amen. I want to pray. I want to give a call out. Maybe there's people here and you don't know Jesus. You may be on the chat. You may be online. You may be on demand. Or maybe someone sent you the link and said, you need to listen to this. I don't know, but maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe your life is out of control. Maybe there are things in your life that are just too big like they were in my life. I want to tell you today, you have access to the presence of God. You can call on the the throne of grace through Jesus Christ and receive him into your life and your life will change. And you say, preacher, I need that. It's too big. It's out of control. Well, let me pray for you. Let me lead you to the king. Come on, if you don't know Jesus, just say these words. Pray with me. Say these words. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again. I put my trust in you. And I thank you that my sin is forgiven. And I have new life. I'm forgiven. I am free. I am favored. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pray now as the worship team come. I want to pray just for those who, you know Jesus. But this season of life has tested you. There's been problems and you've forgotten that you've got the presence of God behind you. You've forgotten that he's in control. You've forgotten that he's bigger than your crisis. And if I could encourage you with any practical things, it would be two simple things. Pray and praise. Prayer is a privileged grace that enables us to lift God bigger than our problems. And it says to him, God, you're in control. You can save them. You can provide this. You can do this. You can solve this. You can heal them. Prayer is, God, I believe you're in control. Yes, at times it's a discipline. Yes, it's a, but, it, but it's, God, you're in control. And praise. You know what praise does? Praise lifts him higher and pulls every problem lower. You lift his name and his power and his glory and heaven above everything that you're going through. And that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to praise. I want you to get your praise on. I know you're in your front room, you're in your onesie, you're in your jamas, you're in your car, but I want you to sing with the worship team. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to give God the glory. I want you to make sure that this situation doesn't take your focus off the King of Kings and I'm going to worship with you. Let me pray first of all. Father, thank you. for The incredible people that are here online, on Zoom or on demand, thank you for this church. Thank you for your word and thank you that you're on the throne. Thank you that you've always been seated. Thank you that heaven doesn't reflect earth, that whatever's going on isn't what is going on in heaven. You're the king, you're the healer, you're the restorer. And thank you that you're bigger than our crisis. I pray right now in Jesus' name, you would reach into every household and into every life and demonstrate your power. Let this be more than a service. Let this be more than words. Let this be more than a sermon. Do something in the supernatural realm right now. And Lord, let there be testimonies of of situations that were so large, but they're overcome by an even greater God. I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.